Welcome to the Early Career Professionals in Mapping webinar series. The American Geosciences Institute has partnered with the National Cooperative Geologic Mapping Program to highlight the work of early career geoscience professionals, especially as it relates to the use and production of geologic maps. Each webinar will begin with a presentation from an early career geoscience professional followed by an interview. Today's presentation is by Brittany Allen, a soil scientist with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, who will discuss her work in soil conservation, the use of technology in soil mapping, and dynamic soil properties. My name is Brittany Allen, and I'm really excited to have this opportunity to talk about how I've utilized geospatial technology in different roles, specifically working for NRCS. Um, talking a bit about how I've gotten to the point where I'm at. When I went to school, I got my undergraduate degree in rangeland ecology and management and my master's in plant science. Um, I don't remember if I mentioned it earlier, but I am currently a soil scientist. So you may be hearing that and going, this doesn't quite line up. How, what, what happened between point A and point B to make this happen? And what happened is I got my first job as a soil conservationist. This is a planner role within RCS, and I primarily worked with landowners and making conservation plans. And from there, I went to being a soil scientist with NRCS. And now my role has changed. I still am providing a product that helps landowners and planners but it's more on the data support side. And I primarily use geospatial technology for data collection and management, whereas before I used it more for planning and measuring the results of those plans. Some uses that I've had with geospatial technology is identifying different spatial patterns. It's been critical for data collection, the quality and distribution of that data. And it's a very powerful communication tool. It can really help bridge language barriers between different areas of expertise. Um, we'll get more into that later on. I wanna start by talking about planning um, and how I used it as a planner. I think it's important to start with talking about what the NRCS mission and vision is when you talk about planning. Because when you are working with these landowners, you are trying to work together to create something that's going to work for the producer for their individual needs as well as protect natural resources so we can help feed our world as it grows. And we also are looking at how can we improve our water supplies? How can we improve our soils? How can we help build this landscape so it's resilient to changes? And how can we help these rural agricultural communities thrive and even our urban agricultural communities thrive? Now, talking about the different stages of planning and how geospatial technology support those. And I do also think it's important at this point to point out that this is not necessarily a linear progression, okay? They are linear for the purpose of working with this presentation, but I think you can kind of see as we go along how these steps could go in a different order and work maybe even better depending on different situations. So starting with identify problems and opportunities. Um, that very frequently, this was brought to me by the producer. It was, hey, Brittany, I want to do a pasture seeding. These are the problems I'm currently experiencing. I'm experiencing low production or I am experiencing a high amount of weeds, something to that effect. And then it's like, well, what they would typically go, I want to do X, Y, and Z. And would be like, all right, let's take a look. Do these support your goals? Do these support your objectives? And that's kind of going into the next step. So before I get that far, uh, talking about how we would use geospatial technologies to support that, a very common practice was with irrigation. And there were policy requirements at the time that I was working as a planner. And that is a little caveat that I need to make clear and upfront is I have not been a planner for two years now. And policy and things like that are things that change on a regular basis. So 
if it comes to more in-depth questions about things like that, I may not be able to answer those questions. But Typically, what I would do is I would look and see, hey, has this piece of property, if we are doing an irrigation project, been irrigated to the last five years? And I would look at aerial imagery, or it could potentially even be, do we have enough of a distance between this point and this point to have the water pressure we need to make the system function if it's a gravity fed system? And that we'll talk more about that later, but that that was something that I would have to communicate with an engineer on because I I don't know the answer to that question. That's not something I've gone to school for. I, there's a lot I don't know about that. Anyway, we will get to that later on. But that's some examples of how we would use geospatial technologies when it came to that aspect. And then determining objectives. This was a very collaborative effort between the planner and the landowner who brought in the proposed project. From there, you inventory your resources. What do we have here? What What's even here? And we would use geospatial technologies a lot for that. It's looking at how much property do we have? What's What plants, what species are already there? Where What state are we trying to get to? And taking into those into account, both the abiotic and the biotic factors analyze resource data. And you could look at this step as the place where what I was doing as a planner and what I do now merge. Um, I would typically use things like web soil survey and ecological site descriptions, especially if I was helping someone formulate a grazing plan. Um, and I would use that data to get a preliminary plan together and then formulate alternatives. Sure, this farmer brought in this idea. What other concerns did they mention? Um, are there other ways we could do this? And then evaluating those and going, okay, which one works best? And then you make the decisions, again, working with the landowner, and they would implement that plan, whatever was decided, and then evaluating the plan. And I think I used my geospatial support most for the evaluation of the plan. Each project that you do as a planner has a certain standard that has to be met. These are called the standard and specifications. And with that, you had to measure and know exactly what was put in place. So for this particular agriculturalist, we planned 30 acres of a range seeding. And he ended up planting 25 because we didn't take into account this really rocky outcrop that's impassable or something, something happened. It doesn't necessarily have to be that example, but just something happened that made it so that didn't work out. No big deal. Um, we, we still have to have an accurate measurement of what was actually implemented so that an accurate payment can be made. Now, talking about Avenza maps and ArcGIS field maps, I have used both of these apps and I'm sure there are plenty more out there um, that might end up being more beneficial for different professions. These are the two I'm familiar with, so these are the two I will be talking about. I primarily used Avenza as a planner. It has a very straightforward interface. It does require knowing how to make a geospatial PDF. Um, but it was very, very useful. Now I use field maps more often because it interacts with Arc Pro a little easier than, a, than the maps on Avenza does, or at least that's my own opinion. I'm sure there are plenty of people who feel differently, and but they're both really great tools with different strengths. And I have a little bit of an example in this corner. And with this picture, it was taken from my phone and this is a topographic map of, oop, excuse me, of the Richfield area. And I have, it has the blue solid dot, which was my current location. And then it has the little balloon dot, which was a marked waypoint. Now, talking as a planner and the importance of geospatial technologies is this partnership effectiveness. I'm going to use this specific example to talk about this point. This was a grazing plan 
you can see a line right here if you look really closely and that is an electric line and that electric line made it so you could move the cattle throughout this pasture this particular pasture had an endangered bird. I do not recall what the bird was at this point, but it had an endangered bird and this was prime habitat for that bird. And so this required communication between the landowner, a wildlife specialist and the planner itself, just to make sure that this grazing plan would support, because the producer was concerned about that as well. The producer also wanted to make sure that they were maintaining the habitat for this particular bird for future generations to also enjoy. This was something this producer cared about. And as a result, this was something that required communicating across disciplines. And we used maps to make that communication clear. Another really common use is particularly with irrigation practices. And especially as going back to what I mentioned before, when I was talking about the planning steps is Sometimes you need to know how much water pressure you, you're going to develop between two points. That's, as I mentioned before, that is completely out of my realm of expertise and I don't know anything about that. And so we would take that information and bring it to an engineer and they would help create a specific standards and specs for the irrigation project that was at hand. Or another example of this needing to communicate between partners could be with eligible acres and what we would consider to be payable. And that's a policy question that sometimes gets a little bit sticky. And there's some areas that aren't explicitly typed out and it would require talking to the state conservationist and going, how do we go about determining the amount of eligible acres for this property. All right, and now transitioning to what I currently do. And so that's what I have in this slide is I have a picture of a hole that we dug out in the West Desert, out west of Milford, which is another small town in Utah. Now talking about the different soil forming factors, I'm sure some of you are familiar with geology maps. Geology maps are super important when it comes to soil mapping. They help us have an idea of the parent material, which is one of the core soil forming factors. Um, your soil is going to look different based on what you started with. It, it's pretty straightforward, but that is not the only thing. You can't just take a geology map and know everything you need to know about that soil. The climate's also going to have a huge effect. This is going to affect how much weathering is occurring and how just what's even happening in that soil, the organisms that are on it. You will have a different soil composition depending on how many earthworms or depending on if you have a lot of conifers versus deciduous trees or there. Yeah, there's just a multitude of different organisms that can change the soil. And this is probably the most dynamic part of soil forming factors. This is, we'll get into it more later, but this is something that affects those dynamic soil properties. There's also the landscape position. So depending on where you're at on the slope, the shape of the slope, is it, is it a linear slope or is it caved in? Is it a concave uh, position? And that's going to affect that as well, as well as the time of development. How long has it been since there was an erosion movement, since there was a depositional movement? How long has this soil been in place? How long has it had time to develop different types of properties? And kind of looking at that, we have a pretty on this, in this picture, we have a pretty developed calcic horizon. That is, you can see how we have this kind of crumbly looking, and then we have a softer, we have some softer looking horizons, and then it gets really rocky. Well, yeah. And then underneath those rocks, there's just this solid white mass. And those occur because of time you've got to have a soil staying in place long enough for something like that to develop. 
there are abiotic factors when you're looking at soils that are completely outside of our control. But soils are dynamic systems, as I mentioned with the living organisms, and they can change dramatically. But in order to understand how those changes are going to work, you have to understand the soil's potential as well as its physical limitations and knowing those things are critical for management. And those are things that we do consider as we map soils. And as we map soils, we create something called an interpretation, which we'll talk about that more in a minute, but the interpretations help managers of properties and lands to make wise choices. Now talking about the more nuts and bolts of what I do, I am located in Utah. We do have winter here. And during the winter, we tend to be more inside. During that time, we are entering data into NASIS, which is our national soil database. And we create maps. That's when we take all the field data that we have collected from the past field season or even field seasons long ago. And we compile those into maps. We conduct our lab work for the soils collected and some we can do in our lab in office. This is a picture of that lab, but some of them we do send to the Kellogg lab in Lincoln, Nebraska. And it depends on the project, which we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And some, this is technically a year round aspect of my job. Um, it just fit better talking about office season, but technically these happen year round. And, technical soil service projects. With this, we work, typically we work hand in hand with the field office, but it's not necessarily a requirement. Sometimes we have people who reach out to us directly asking us questions that are related to soils and what they can do. Um, and sometimes we have planners that reach out to us and go, hey, we have a producer that wants to make an irrigation pond in this spot. Is that something we could do? And they ask for our expertise with those projects. Now with field season, there is a pre-field preparation, which we'll talk about more on the next slide. Uh, a lot of our field work, especially right now, is going towards initial soil survey work, which is what you see on when you go to web soil survey. And we have an initiative to finish, to get as much of that done by 2026 as possible. And so that's where a lot of our efforts as far as field work is at this moment in time. And then we have dynamic soil properties, which these are asking questions relevant to the, sp the specific area that we're in and relating to what we mentioned earlier with how you can have very dramatic changes in soil just depending on the organisms that are present. Now, the pre-field work preparation, we... We studied the geology and the landforms and we get, we make a, there's a preliminary map that is made. And then we draw transects across those preliminary units. And from there, it's the practicality. How long approximately is it going to take me to get from point X to point Y? And these areas aren't all easy to get to. Uh, this particular one is the West Desert Utah 626 survey. And some, this is, there, this is a very remote area and some of these spots take a couple hours from any decent road to get to. And just to put a side-by-side -side comparison of the geology maps to our proposed soil maps, this is the Utah 626 area. And you can see, yes, there is a correspondence with the geology unit and these, especially like we have this surficial alluvium and colluvium, and then we have this 172 unit right here that is almost a mirror image. But it, you can also see that our soil units are a lot more dissected, and that is based off of different types of data, like hillshade data, sometimes LIDAR data that was not available for this particular survey, but it is, it, it is something that is used. Or it can be aerial imagery. Maybe we can see a dramatic difference on these preliminary maps between different ecological types. Welcome everyone. 
Um, I'm excited to do this little demonstration. You can, the way that I typically start is I Google web soil survey. Uh, the top result will take you to this page, click this giant green button. And as you can see, there are a lot of options for how you can import your area of interest. If you have a shape file, you can use that. You can use an address. What I'm going to use for demonstration purposes today is the Utah 626 soil survey because that is currently what I am working on. And this, this just shows that our AOI is set. This is the soil survey area. And then we can go to these different tabs. We have this general soil map. It shows these different soil components on the left. You can click on one and get a brief overview for what you have in that map unit. Um, it can be, yeah, so this is a complex. You have the Uvada soil as well as playas. It shows roughly how much they make up of this unit and different properties, qualities, different minor components that may also be in it. Then we can go to the Soil Data Explorer. And starting with the intro to soils, this can be a great place if you need more information on any particular topic. We have the suitabilities and limitations for use. A great example is dwellings with basements, view rating, and this will show us what we have in this map unit area. And no, so it'll tell us if it's not limited, somewhat limited, or very limited, and it will tell us why based on the different soil component. Another thing you can look at is the properties and qualities. Great example here is calcium carbonate. For these, you do have to enter a top and bottom depth, and that will change depending on what's useful to you. This has a rating as a percentage, as well as how many acres of it are in the AOI and how much of a percentage it is of the AOI. And then we have our ecological sites, you all ecological sites info, and you scroll down. So I'm going to demonstrate, when you click on this, it'll take you to edit. I have already downloaded this particular description. Um, so we'll just go straight there instead of waiting for things to load. The, it starts off with information that is also on the website. So this map, it's also on the edit website, these, as well as these MLRA notes. MLRA stands for, we'll scroll up, major land resource area. The, for this particular example, we are in ancient Lake Bonneville. Give you some information on that. It'll talk about the ecological site concept, which takes into account the, the structure, the landform. Um, it, and then going into further depth, has your parent material, surface textures, ecological dynamics. And this is something I definitely want to touch on. This was very useful to me when I was a planner. Let's shrink that. So what you have here is you have a community type and each of these labeled pathways will have further explanation further down. And so this is a great map to for seeing where you may be currently as well as where you may want to go or, you know, things to that, where you may want to go, where you may have been, past, future, present. Um, and here is that more in-depth detail that I was mentioning earlier. This first community 1.1 also has a general annual production information, and this can be used to get a very general grazing management plan written up. And then it also has a little bit, you can see how it describes each of the community types, and then it also has these pathways. I don't know if you remember, let's scroll up without giving you whiplash. 
but these are the pathways. And so these, what that label is referring to is going like, oh, if you go from 1.1 to 1.2, you could go there via 1.1b is a potential option. So let's read 1.1b. Sorry for all the scrolling. I know it's kind of hard, but you get there through a recent fire occurrence. And these are different things that you can do just to plan and to help give an idea of where you might want to be. So this is a brief overview of Web Soil Survey and the tools in it. I thank you for your time. All right. I, I hope that demonstration was helpful. Um, now talking about, so that all of that was initial soil survey. Um, the work that we do to create the web soil survey and the to produce the data there. This is a dynamic soil properties project. It was done uh, close to Kanab, Utah. And these are more in depth. And we will, for these projects, we do work closely with the Kellogg Laboratory. And what this particular project is looking at is how one particular soil type in this case and in this example it's the Parkali series and it's looking at how the soil properties change depending on what vegetation is there in this particular site you're looking at juniper versus sagebrush as the predominant species we did water infiltration test that's what this picture over here is it's uh what's referred to as a saturo and then we have our 232, which is a full description. It's looking, it's a soil. If any of you guys have done soil judging, it is basically exactly that where you determine your horizons, you do a infill, in field texture of the soils, and you also measure the amount of roots and pores. You look at how the soil is shaped when you take it out of the out of the profile and there there's many more factors you do in field ph test it's a whole thing and you're looking at how things change and what is changing and with that i want to open open up to any questions and these are different areas that i've had the opportunity to see this top picture it's hard to tell it but it has a lot of scarlet globe mallow and that's, it was so orange and so pretty. And then you also come across little wonders. This, these kilns were out in the middle of nowhere where I was not expecting to see anything. So anyway, I absolutely love my job. I'm excited to answer any questions you guys have. Brittany, thank you for sharing some of the work that you do related to soil mapping. Lindsay and I are excited to dive into some of the details and hear about your experiences leading you into this stage of your career. And just a reminder to the audience, if you are tuning in during the premiere, Brittany is available to answer questions in the chat. So Brittany, let's start off by talking about the way, if you always knew that you wanted to go into rangeland ecology and management, and if you can tell us about some of the education experiences leading up to you selecting that as your college major. Yeah, so... Um, no, I did not always want to go into rangeland ecology and management. When I was in high school, I was pretty convinced I was going to be an elementary school teacher. Um, my mom was an elementary school teacher and I, I do, I do love working with kids. And so I thought that was something I would end up doing. But as I volunteered in that avenue and had more experiences there, I came to realize that wouldn't be the best career field for me. Something else I was doing at the same time and congruently, though, is I also was participating in FFA, um, which is an acronym for Future Farmers of America. And I, as well as my mom being a school teacher, my dad was a farmer, and I had a lot of opportunities in a agricultural background to realize just how much I really enjoyed learning about natural sciences and kind of what cemented my desire to go the rangeland ecology route uh, was my experience with the Society for Range Management's High School Youth Forum. That was a very key experience for me. I, 
I made a lot of jokes about it when I was going off to leave. I I didn't really expect it to go anywhere, but then when I was there, I realized I really genuinely loved it. I loved learning about, yes, at first the plant identification seemed kind of silly and like it was just rote memorization, but then when my instructors applied it in a way that was like, oh, if I recognize that this plant has these ecological functions and plays a role in this system like this, then I can make decisions based off of that type of knowledge. And that really changed my perspective. And then I did very well, to me, unexpectedly, um, at this camp. And I got to compete at the national level and meet people from all across the United States, which also was really important. And when I was there, I met Dr. Fee Busby, and he ended up being very influential to me. I remember doing this camp, participating in the activities and learning from him and being, I knew he went to Utah State University and I was just like, you know, even if I just had one class with him, at least I would kind of know what I'm getting into. And that whole transition going from high school to college and all the unknowns with that, having something that I was kind of like, at least I know what I'm kind of expecting here and I know I'm going to enjoy it was really helpful for me. And Fee continues to be one of the most influential mentors um, during that time of my life. And I'm very, very, very grateful that I had him during that time. And that was definitely a huge thing that got me into rangeland ecology and management. And then as I mentioned in the presentation, I'm a soil scientist now, and the way that that kind of came about was I took a basic soils class that was required for my degree, and I remember going into it kind of the same way I did with that range camp, and it was a little bit unenthusiastic, and I was just like, you know, I don't really know if I'm going to like this, and then I ended up absolutely loving it and learning so much, and I was like, you know, I think I want to add a soil miner, and I did not realize that that soil miner that was just kind of like, hey, why not do this while we're at it, um, would end up being such an important part of my career later on. That's fantastic. Um, well, speaking of your training and in your schooling, what are some key skills that you developed during your undergraduate and master's programs that have benefited you in your current role? Yeah. Um, I would say that the most important skills I learned during that time were less geared toward the technical career skills that I gained, although those were critically important. And as I mentioned earlier, like learning how plants and the roles that they played in the ecosystem, that has been very critical technical knowledge for me to have throughout different jobs that I've had. Um, but it was the personal growth that I made learning those skills. Um, learning how to manage my time wisely, learning how to believe in myself enough to take initiative. That's something I still kind of struggle with, if I'm completely honest with myself. It's like, do I really know enough to take the lead on this particular project? And having to go, you know what, we're going to just go for it and we can ask questions as we go has been very important for me to learn how to do. Um, learning how to gather information from multiple different sources. Uh, when I was a soil conservationist, I the scientific background is beyond critical. You have to have it for sure. The aspect that sometimes gets forgotten or overlooked in a planning aspect is the role of the producer, the people that you're working with. These Typically, these are farmers or ranchers that have been on that property for multiple generations at times. I mean, not all the time, but times... They are multiple generations farm gen, generational farmers and they have a lot of knowledge they can share and also only they know what management practices have been done which matters a lot to how you go into that and that learning how to take in all those different types of information and apply them appropriately was a very critical thing for me to learn and then Another really important thing was to find joy and growth, no matter how uncomfortable it was, kind of in a way I kind of leaned into that earlier where it was like I had to learn how to trust myself and taking initiative on things that felt bigger than myself. 
And that's very uncomfortable. That's really hard and it's intimidating and scary. And that, but learning how to be comfortable with that has been very key um, throughout all of this. Cause as I, I did not go into soil science explicitly. And so in my current role, I'm constantly learning new things that I did not have the opportunity to learn in school. And that's definitely, all those have been the most key parts for my progress in moving in this position and the things that I've been able to learn here. Awesome, thank you, Brittany. And you kind of touched upon this a little bit, but can you talk more about how you collaborate with landowners, um, whether it's to identify problems or opportunities in their plans? Because um, it sounds really iterative and you just mentioned a lot of back and forth and really trusting the landowners themselves. Well, I mean, in the end, um, when it comes to trusting the landowners, um, when you are a planner at NRCS, your role there is not to uh, correct. Your role there is to see what the landowner themselves are willing to do and how you can add on to what they can do. And this is very multifaceted. It um, because each producer comes with a different set of skills and with different resources at their abilities. For some of these farmers, it's a whole family affair. It's grandpa's involved, dad's involved, the kids are involved. It's an entire group project. For others, it, it's not uncommon to have older producers that are having mobility issues and they're the last ones who are interested in farming. That's also something that happens. And you have you have to take into account things like that. You have to be realistic about what the producer's management level is and what they can actually do. And then you also have to make sure that the tools that you give them fall within that. And there's also traditional aspects that you have to think of. Farmer Joe may be coming to you looking for a sprinkler system. He may he or she may want to implement better irrigation practices. While you're there, you might also happen to see, well, why can't we, what, how would you feel about doing X, Y, or Z? And, but you can't force someone to do that. They have to want to do it. And so it's kind of, you, you as the planner know what programs your, um, your job has, what you're pushing forward, you know what's available. And then just kind of feeling out and understanding where they're coming from and what they can realistically manage. It sounds like a really difficult process, but it sounds like a really important one um, because we know that one of your main roles is, you know, creating maps and, you know, giving that as one of the tools that you have for these landowners. So can you describe the process of creating those preliminary maps and how they are used in field surveys? So the there is a little bit, I kind of have to suss out the two different roles that I've talked about in this presentation because they're different depending on the role. As a soil conservationist, those maps uh, were very much so what resources are here. And we are looking at things all across the spectrum. We're looking at, is there a historic homesteading shed here that we need to be mindful of as far as cultural resources? We're looking at, does this does this rancher already have a pump that we can hook a trough up to for water and grazing management plans? We are looking at what is already here when it comes to that, and it's more resource-based. When it comes to soil survey, the preliminary maps for that are very different. It's less so what can we build and more of how the land itself can be used. So we're looking more at the geology, we're looking at aerial imagery, and granted we look at aerial imagery for the other as well to kind of see if we can see historic implications of past practices. But again, it's more focused on what we can do, what resources, what resources are already there, and more of a material aspect. Whereas what soil survey is, is more of what soils do we have how can we expect the system to function as a whole? Great, thanks, Brittany. And sort of relatedly, can you describe also the process of inventorying your resources and how geospatial technology supports the step? Yeah, honestly, what it that typically looks like in the practical on the grounds 
point of it was when I was a planner, the producer would be like, I want to do X, Y, and Z. We'd go out, look at the property. Um, for one particular example that I'm thinking of, they wanted to implement a wheel line system and they were currently using a flood irrigation system. This was a really unique space where you could not, you could not see how much water pressure was actually building based off of aerial imagery. You had to have boots on the ground because the way that it worked is there was this rock and the water came from this high elevated point and the field was down like immediately there was a steep drop off and down there. So you had significantly more water pressure than you ever would have expected just looking at aerial imagery and it was kind of hidden by the tree cover. And so with that particular situation, the inventorying of the resource was the water pressure that we had up here so that we could know what type of irrigation system to put in place. And that, like getting into the details on that is above my pay grade. I am not an engineer. I've not been trained as an engineer in any shape, way, or form. And that was a situation where we took those points for the engineer and he was able to make those calculations for a system that would work in this situation. And is it typical that the resource that you're uh, identifying and inventorying is water or are there other resources that you typically um, look at as well? I mean, I do work in the Intermountain West. Water, <laughs> water is a big issue out here and irrigation systems was probably one of my top things that I did work on, but it was not the only thing. Um, we had a lot of ranchers come in who would go, I want to put fencing up or I want to implement a better grazing rotation and I would like to have some movable electric lines that I can run through this pasture to move my cows in a better, more ecologically sound manner. Or it could be, I want to protect this riparian area and make sure my cows can't get into it. Um, it also, we did have the occasional um, small farmer or rancher where it was someone on like, they had about an acre of property with their home and they wanted to implement like a greenhouse system or um, actually greenhouse is the incorrect term for that, a high tunnel system. And the high tunnel, we would see like, do they have a water source going to it? Are they going to need a water source going to it? What does their water right? And the water right is not so, you can't necessarily use geospatial technologies to do that. That's a more legal aspect of it. Would their water right even support the irrigation system that we would need to implement to put the system that they want in place for what their goals are? Great. Well, we know another thing that you look at are dynamic soil property. So those factors that change throughout a person's lifetime. Um, so over what time span do they usually occur? So is it actually a lifetime or is it shorter than that? It's going to depend. As with most things in ecology and just everything, it's going to depend on your climate. It's going to depend on your management practices. Um, so when it comes to an exact time span, it's going to be hard to put an exact number on that because it just depends. The things that do tend to change more rapidly are things like soil organic matter, infiltration, and soil aggregation. And those change in response directly to management changes or natural changes. And a good example with, is with infiltration. You could have a very well permeable soil, meaning the water just goes right through it. No issues. You're not having any hard clays to hold it up. You aren't hitting bedrock immediately. That just sends the water a different direction. You could have that. You could have a lot of water storage in a particular soil. And then a management decision could be made of, well, we need to put a home here. Someone's building a home here and we need to lay a foundation for this. And so they bring in the jumping jack and they compact the soil. That soil no longer has that type of water holding capacity. Not, and it's one, it's a value call that has to be made by the person in charge. It's, is having this water holding capacity more important for my goals or is building this home more important for my goals? And that's, it's just a value call that has to be made. That sounds like such an interesting aspect, too, of the work is for mappers that we've talked about, they've gone out, they've mapped, they've 
um, assess the area and then all of a sudden someone comes in and changes it very quickly and is that not valid anymore and all of the details that go along with that I'm sure an interesting complication to your job. Well, that's actually something we try to account for. So when we are doing our soil survey, we also do something called an interpretation, which we kind of had a brief moment looking at in that demonstration with the dwellings with basements. But there are many different interpretations and they change depending on what region you're in. I, out where I'm at, we're looking at mostly ranching and farming, building structures, things like that. But in parts of the world where there are things like cranberry bogs, where you have a specialized use for a specialized type of soil. Those are interpretations that are done in those parts of the world. So those, those changes are things we try to account for when we are doing those soil surveys. And I think that probably touches a little bit about the Soil 2026 initiative you talked about, about mapping all the different areas. Um, can you talk more about just the importance of that and also its impact on your work? Yes, the point of the Soil 2026 is to have an initial map. And granted with the time allotted and everything else, these are going to be done on different scales depending on where you are. And there are also parts of the country that have had these initial soil surveys done for quite some time. It's where this initiative has really had more of an effect is places like where I'm at in the Western United States or up in Alaska, where you're looking at really rugged country that's hard to map. It's It hasn't the reason it's gone so long, there is a practical reason for it. Um, and But it doesn't change that these areas still have major use and impact in many, many different walks of lives and for many different people. And having this kind of data out there and available is going to be helpful for anyone who is in charge of managing land resources. And then in terms of the soil initiative kind of wrapping up theoretically in 2026, if it gets accomplished, how does that you think it's going to impact the future of soil mapping from then on? Because of all the changes you mentioned where people can alter the land, do you think that there's going to be a remapping? Do you think more people are going to start being interested in the dynamic soils team? Um, can you just talk about what, what your predictions are with where things will go? Well, absolutely. Um, soil mapping is not going to be done. <laughs> we we will have a general idea um and i'm going to use that as an example the current survey that i'm working on the utah 626 which is in beaver county in utah um we are mapping that at what is considered an order four we have different degrees of scale when it comes to these soil order maps and when you map at an order four you are looking at things being accurate at a scale of about 200,000 hectares and for the purpose of accuracy, you cannot look at a finer scale than that. If you're wanting to do a one acre farm or something to that extent on something that we have mapped to that level, it's it's not going to be highly accurate. Um, but if you are looking on a landscape scale and you are looking at, hey, we have this BLM allotment that is about this many acres or hectares, um, you can make decisions on that level. So we will, by the time the 2026 initiative is over, we will have an order for survey for Beaver County, but there will be a need in the future to get that down to a finer scale, hopefully to an order three or, and depending on needs, who knows. The nice, and then going on with the rest of your question, talking about dynamic soil properties, that is definitely as initial soil survey gets wrapped up, we are going to go more to dynamic soil property projects. And I think that's a huge benefit because there's a lot of flexibility with those. There's a lot of ability to listen to local people and do these um, experiments, for lack of a better term, uh, that can directly benefit them and answer those local questions. So I think there's a lot of power with that. There's also a lot of work as it relates as it relates to carbon storage that we have also been asked to be in charge of. I have, when it comes to more questions on that, we are not anywhere near that where I am at. As I mentioned, we have a lot of rugged country. We are still trying to map. So I do not have personal experience on that particular topic. I just know that it is happening in certain offices and that's the extent of my knowledge with that. But 
There is a lot of work to do when it comes to soils, understanding what their potential is and what we can do. And it's there's going to be a lot of work in this for a long time. So well, you kind of already. Oh, sorry. Oh, no, you're good. It sounds great because I know that when we're working with a bunch of high school students right now and they're like, OK, well, it, things are wrapping up. We're we're good on soils. It's nice to hear. Obviously, that's not the case. And there's always more to learn, always more to do and other areas to uh, investigate. Definitely. Yeah, because yeah, as you mentioned, like the dynamic properties that change over a lifetime, that in and of itself could require, you know, extra mapping um, and updating those maps and in, into web soil survey. Um, and you kind of already touched on this, but can you talk more about who could use web soil survey, like who uses it the most um, and maybe some common common interpretations that they might access on it? Absolutely. So honestly, Web Soil Survey is a useful tool for anybody. Um, anybody who manages any type of property, whether you are a private landowner and you're just going, oh, how successful would a garden potentially be? You could look at farmlands with irrigation and you might be able to get a little bit more of an idea how successful you may be. Or if you're looking at buying a home, it's like, huh, I'm looking at X, Y, and Z house. This house I know has a basement. How, how stable is that basement? It might seem like overkill to some people. I can I can respect that, but it is a resource that anyone can use. It is available to the public. Um, I, I also can't deny, yes, I think everyone can use it, but I do think our primary consumers are, are NRCS planners, um, as well as USDA employees, um, United States Department of Agricultural employees, because I know that our BLM, uh, co-workers also use it quite a bit, are well familiar with it, as well as Forest Service. So I do think federal employees tend to be our main customer of this product, but I do think anyone who manages land can use it. Yeah, that's awesome. I know I've played around with, a little bit with it, especially with some educators. And there's a lot of information on there. Um, mm -hmm. But one of the aspects of it is interesting is when there is a gap of well, why isn't this mapped yet and so it's nice again to hear that those gaps are going to be filled in and you guys are going to be finishing the mapping um, and you touched on this a little bit but you mentioned how rugged areas are kind of typically the last areas to be mapped based on their difficulties can you talk more about the field work that you conduct in these sites and how you prepare and some challenges you encounter while working in these remote areas Absolutely. Um, this is the part of my job I love the most. So hence the um, almost uncontrollable excitement. Um, but what the way that I prepare, there is the preliminary work, like you have to have your maps, you have to kind of know what you're going, where you're going, the, the conditions that are going to be there when you do get there. And you also have to acknowledge the different levels of remote when you are planning for this. The remote work that I do in Utah, it mostly means having the technology and information I need in formats that don't require cell service or internet. It can mean at times a camping out in the field because the site's a little too far away. That's about what remote means to me. However, I do have um, coworkers and peers that are working in places like Montana and Idaho and Alaska other states like that that just have vast areas of wilderness where working in these remote areas looks very different than that. Remote to them can look like coming in on a pack mule. Um, it can look like helicoptering in in certain spots in Alaska or even using dirt bikes. But regardless of the skill of remote, I always make sure that I carry a satellite phone and a small first aid kit and whatever things might be necessary for safety. And that can even change on the time of year, not just location. Where I am at, out in Beaver County, I make sure that when I'm out in the field in October, I'm wearing an orange vest because there's a lot of hunting that goes on in that area. Um, when I worked further north, I made sure I carried bear spray with me. So it just depends on where you are. And it, the thing with field work and being prepared for field work is you do have to have some self-critical thinking skills skills with that, you do have to look at, well, this is what I know about the area. What would I potentially need in order to be safe considering these conditions? 
Great. Thank you. Um, and so when we talk to other people about, you know, their favorite rocks and whatnot, you know, we, we need you get a little bit of personality <laughs> and see like what you're really into. So I have to ask, do you have a favorite soil type um, that you like to study or that you've seen out in the field? And if so, what do you like about it? I, I just like being surprised. I like going sour and going, oh, this was not what I was expecting to see here at all. I, I like that feeling. Um, other than that, I mean, and with that, it can be, I mean, for someone in the Midwest, seeing a uh, seeing a mall saw is not that cool. I can understand it's probably not being that cool when you're from the Midwest. But for me, where I'm at, and I tend to have a lot of aritasols, I come, aclo- I come across a mall saw and I'm like, look at you. I wasn't expecting you here. It's so nice to see you. And it's just, I, I, that's what I enjoy is being pleasantly surprised. Um, if, if there's a lack of that, if the hole's easy to dig, I'm not going to lie. That's also great. That's also a pleasant surprise in and of itself. Always grateful when my hole is easy to dig. I love that. That's hysterical. I did some work in hydrology and it was like, yeah, when you got the piezometer, the tube installed easily, it was like, all right, that's my favorite. It's good yep. to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I love how you're, you uh, contrasted with like your excited part, you're most excited about the rugged terrain and the hard parts of your job, but then digging an easy hole is also a favorite. So it's every, great. Yeah, it sounds great. All right, Brittany, well, I think we have time for about one more question. Um, and we typically ask our early career professionals about what is the future like for you? What goals do you have and what do you see is on the horizon? Yeah, um, I mean, I I do love my job that I currently have. Um, So I'm hoping to progress in my agency, but also stay in field work centered positions for as long as I physically can. Um, The field work is what brings me the most joy. So I'm hoping to continue that. Um, One of the only things that I kind of have a struggle with is I do still love to teach. Um, And so every time I get an opportunity like something like this, I get really excited about it and I go after it. But And so with this and with where I'm currently at in my position, I do look for active ways to participate in my community and to have opportunities to talk about what I do. Um, I would also like to get my PhD at some point. That has been a dream for me that I haven't been able to get to. And I do hope that that is something I can accomplish in the near future. That's awesome. I love the nod to outreach that you had mentioned because we love to work with people. Uh, Just a quick little plug. uh, If you want to contact Brittany, let us know. She can talk (laughs) to your students. Uh, We'll get you connected. But it's great to, again, have all professionals, and especially early career professionals, working with students and just bringing your knowledge to them. It's, It's such an interesting and dynamic interaction that we always cherish. So thanks for offering that. Awesome. And then Brittany, again, thank you so much for talking with us today, sharing your work, and then also talking with us. Uh, We've learned a ton about soil mapping and your background and how it relates to conservation. And we're just excited for the webinar to be shared with everyone. So thank you so much for today. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed this opportunity. Thank you for attending today's webinar. If you have any additional questions for Brittany, please email them to us at webinars at americangeosciences.org. This concludes our Early Career Professionals and Mapping webinar series for the fall of 2024. Please join us again in 2025 for more webinars from this series.